very warm welcome to Rokeley Parish Church for our Palm Sunday service. It's really lovely to see you all. Uh, welcome to, to anyone who's joining us on the live stream this morning. Over the last couple of months, we've been following a sermon series on what it means for us to be disciples of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And today we consider how we can know God's love, love that was demonstrated so completely at the cross. Before our first hymn, which is based on the events of Palm Sunday, I'm just going to read a few verses from Mark's Gospel to set the context. So this is Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So let's sing together as the crowds did that day. O oh, glory, Lord and honour to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring. Please stand to sing.
sit or kneel for our time of confession. We've just been praising Jesus as the crowd did on the first Palm Sunday. And what a wonderful occasion that must have been. But we're also very aware that like those crowds, we can so easily turn our backs on Jesus. So a moment to reflect on how we've fallen short as his disciples this week. Almighty God, we confess that we often have taken the easy way of the world rather than your way, and so have grieved your heart of love. We have been slow to admit that we are not our own, but belong to you. In your mercy, forgive us and help us. We have been unwilling to see that we are bought with the price of Christ's blood. In your mercy, forgive us and help us. We have been unprepared to live out our lives as your servants. In your mercy, forgive us and help us. Raise us by the power of your love and fill us with the joy of your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for Palm Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our second hymn today focuses on Jesus' love for us, demonstrated throughout his journey to the cross. Love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. So please stand to sing, My Song is Love Unknown.
please be seated. Jerry is going to come and read for us about the Lord Jesus. Firstly, a prophecy from Isaiah, and secondly, from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Thanks, Jerry. Yes, the first uh, reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 7, and that can be found on page 742 of the Pew Bible. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep for its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence was any deceit in his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. We then turn to the second reading, which can be found on page 1151 of the Pew Bible. This is 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 to 17. not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord. Before Rob comes to preach for us, let's respond to the words of Scripture by standing and declaring our faith in the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, as uh, we think about uh, Jesus heading into Jerusalem on the way to the cross. We thank you for the uh, memorial of those great events 
that you've given us to sustain us in our faith. Uh, we pray now that as we look at uh, the Apostle Paul's words about this, you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this month um, we've been looking at how, as disciples of Jesus, we maintain the relationship, that precious relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. We've thought about how, by the Spirit, we hear God's voice in the Bible. How, by the Spirit, we can seek God's help in prayer. And today, we turn our attention to communion, or the Lord's Supper. How we can know God's love for us. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. And events rapidly uh, unfold as we read through those passages in the Gospels through the Last Supper on what we remember as Maundy Thursday to the cross on Good Friday. And that is, of course, the focus of our communion on the night that he was betrayed. We begin with those words so often in our services. I don't know what sort of week uh, you've had as you gather together here this morning. I've had better weeks, I've had worse weeks. And of course, in the rough and tumble of daily life, um, that's not to be unexpected. It is normal as we follow Jesus that sometimes life is great and we feel a really close walk with God. Sometimes, frankly, life is really tough and we wonder where God is or whether we're still in touch with him. The question is, in all the variety of our experience of daily life, how do we sustain our relationship with Jesus? Now, in many ways, uh, you could argue that that is the big question that St. Paul is addressing when he wrote this letter, the letter we have called 1 Corinthians. And in it, um, he mentions, he actually quotes them, a number of things they're saying and doing. Um, and he addresses them all. And in a, in, a, in a way, all of these things they're seeking to do are ways they are seeking to really establish the best and closest relationship with Jesus Christ. So they're trying to answer that question. How do we sustain our relationship? Um, and they have a variety of solutions. I'm not going to ask you to turn back through it all at the moment, but you may want to read some of these later. In chapter 3, they thought the answer was to get the right leader. And so they ended up divided over whether Paul or Peter or Apollos was the real deal. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, they sought the answer in enjoying all the pleasures of the world, leading to all sorts of ungodly behavior. In chapters 12 to 14, it's all about healings, miracles. And in the midst of all of this, we find chapters 10 and 11, where Paul teaches us about communion. In chapter 10, they're warned at the beginning of chapter 10 to learn from the example of Israel's history. He begins chapter 10, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, and he goes on to talk about what they went through in the wilderness. Life was tough. They'd experienced the amazing events of the Exodus, the ancient Israelites, and they were in the wilderness. And they were wondering, where is God in all of this? How do we sustain our relationship with God? And they took their eyes off God and chased after all, all, all sorts of other things, as the Corinthians in their generation were doing, and as we may be tempted to in our day. And so, as Paul develops this argument, the answer he gives to the Corinthians, as they struggle to keep close to the Lord, is to draw their focus back to the Lord's Supper. This is the place to sustain a close relationship with the Lord and to know 
his love for us. So to help us to see why, I want to focus on three words this morning. A remembrance, a promise, and a presence. So looking at that bit Jerry read from chapter 11 first, in verse 23, a remembrance. In um, that verse, verse 23, Paul takes us back to the very words that Jesus gave him and commissioned him to faithfully pass on. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And at the heart of what follows is Jesus' command, twice repeated in verse 24 and 25. Do this in remembrance of me. And what is it that we are to remember? That Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed. In other words, we are to remember his death. Yes, even his death on the cross, as was prophesied in our first reading from Isaiah. Why is it so important to keep remembering this? After all, I suspect for, for nobody here is this their first Palm Sunday. It's not the first time you're going through the events of Holy Week and Easter this coming week. We know the story of what happened there. Why is it so important to keep remembering? It is because without doing something tangible, we are so prone to forget. And if you think about it, in our normal lives we do all sorts of things to help our memory, to help us remember things which of course we already knew. People put um, uh, things on their fridge magnets, on the fridge, memos, a knotted handkerchief. When I was teaching and in the bustle of a day pick up something important, I'd often just write it on the back of my hand. Even in preparing this talk, it's not that I don't know what I'm saying, but the very act of writing it down helps cement it in my memory. I know from the years of experience being here with you, if you tell me your name at the door and I write it down, I'm much more likely to remember your name next time than if I simply commit it to memory and hope it's still there next time I see your face. And having written it down, even if I never read that memo, I know I'm much more likely to remember your name. I've done something tangible, which helps cement it in our minds. And Jesus knows that in a busyness of our lives, our minds and our souls are like sieves. In the Lord's Supper, he's given us something tangible, a remembrance to sustain our relationship with him. But of course, it's not simply a remembrance because the Lord's Supper comes with a promise. And the central promise uh, in these words is of a new covenant. Uh, that is a kind of legal contract that these days uh, would need to be signed and witnesses by a respectable, respectable person. Um, you've all probably had to sign various covenants on various occasions and had to try and find a doctor or an accountant and whatever I, I can remember having to do something like that, and um, it was with some, was it with some Irish organisation? And I, I, this doesn't say anything about Roman Catholic priests in Ireland, I'm sure, but but vicars weren't on the list of acceptable honourable people for this Irish company to to witness, to witness their thing. But anyway, that's that's completely an aside. Sorry, where am I? Um, yeah, the point you you get the point that um, a covenant, a legal agreement you know, has to be signed and witnessed. And in this case, in the case of the Lord's Supper, uh, Jesus signs and seals uh, this covenant, uh, not with ink, not with a special pen, but as uh, Paul says here, with his blood. So each time we take the cup to drink, um, as we look at the wine, we, as it were, see Jesus' signature and are reminded of the promise of the new covenant he has made with us. Uh, but what is that covenant? Paul doesn't say in these verses. 
But uh, Jesus himself does tell us what that is uh, at the institution of the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, verse 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And many centuries earlier, the prophet Jeremiah had foretold that the Lord would make a new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 34. And in it, the Lord says, For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. That's what the promise is. The promise that our sins have been dealt with by the sacrifice that was described in Isaiah 53 in our first reading. So in communion, our relationship with Jesus is sustained by the reminder that our past, however messy it has been, and the reason we can have confession at the start of every service is that we recognize that for every one of us, there is mess in our lives, day by day, week by week. However messy that has been, it has been dealt with. It has been forgiven, washed clean, a clean slate. That is the promise that we receive that sustains our relationship, that tells us how much God loves us. But there is also the promise, um, not just that the past is dealt with, because clearly we all have anxieties about our future too. There's the promise in this covenant that one day Jesus will return. Verse 26 of chapter 11. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Um, the Beatles, back in the 1960s, wrote a song about people being really, really old when they reach 64. Well, I'm not far off that myself. Um, and you sort of might think, well, at that age, you have to start worrying about the future. <laughs> but in the communion, we have the reminder that our past is dealt with and that our future is completely secure with Jesus when he returns again in glory. And so that is the context in which we all live our lives day by day. What is behind us, the past, is absolutely dealt with because God loved us so much. He gave his son to forgive us our sins. And our future is totally secure because he loved us so much. He's prepared a place for us with him, through faith in him, in glory. It is so often, isn't it, our sense of guilt about what we've done in the past. Perhaps knowing the truth that God forgives us, but perhaps unable to forgive ourselves. But also our anxieties about our future that rob us of the peace of knowing that we are loved by God and we are sustained by him. Well, here in the promise of the covenant which is given to us in communion, both of these anxieties are settled and our relationship with Jesus sustained. So we have a remembrance, a promise, and thirdly, a presence. Remember, of course, it is described as the Lord's table and invites us to eat with him. The one loaf is described in chapter 10 as his body, a participation in his body and his blood. Now we know that Jesus was born as a real human being, someone that, um, as John writes in his letter, um, that we have seen, we have touched, we've heard, a real person, not just a phantom or a spirit, that he died physically when they pierced him on the cross, uh, blood and water came from his side. And that he was physically raised when they ate with him um, at, at the lakeside. And, um, and when they talked with him um, after the resurrection, he was physically raised. And that he was then ascended to his father's side in glory. 
So the body of Jesus is now in heaven. However, in communion, we have the promise that he is spiritually present. And he gives us his bread and wine as the signs of his presence. Hence the words we use when we're distributing the bread and wine. Whoever is here with me says, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The bread and the wine are a visible sign of an invisible reality, namely the presence of Jesus that we receive in our hearts by faith. And so as chapter 10 verse 16 says, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? We receive him spiritually by faith. So the Bible's answer to sustaining our weary souls through the challenges and distractions of daily life isn't to chase miracles, spiritual experiences, special leaders, pleasures of the world, but communion, the Lord's Supper, the remembrance, the promise, and the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the church I grew up in, um, the tradition was communion at Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. Some of you may remember that from your past. Personally, I think as a remembrance, that's too infrequent. I know I need more regularly to be sustained in my relationship with Jesus than just those three times a year. In some church traditions, it is the main service every week, sometimes even every day and midweek too. I wonder if that runs the risk of becoming so habitual that the impact and significance is lost. You know that if you set lots of alarms, well, when the first one goes off, you will sleep through it, knowing there are others to come. And before you know where you are, they've all gone off and you've slept through the lot. We know how an overused reminder can lose its impact. Becoming so familiar, we cease to notice it. Perhaps if you write a memo and put it on your fridge or leave something by the door to remind you, you walk past it so often, it becomes simply part of the furniture and you cease to even notice it. It's not that it's not there and doesn't happen. You just don't notice it anymore and it doesn't serve its purpose. Um, and I wonder if that can be a danger too with, uh, as it were, overly frequently uh, gathering uh, around the Lord's table. Of course, it will be an individual decision. I'm not saying there's a right and a wrong here. But we should neither neglect nor treat with over-familiarity our coming together around the Lord's table to remember as he commanded us uh, to, to know his promise, to sustain us and his presence with us. So as disciples, those seeking to follow Jesus, we have the Bible by which through the Spirit we can hear God's voice. We have prayer, which by the Spirit we can approach God for help. And we have communion, which by the Spirit we meet with Jesus and are assured of God's love for us. These are three key means of God's grace that the Lord has given us to sustain us in our relationship with him as his disciples and to protect us against the folly of taking our eyes off him, as the ancient Israelites and Corinthians were tempted to do. So in conclusion, um, this little book, the Book of Common Prayer, it has these exhortations in it, in the communion service, which we never read. I'm not going to read the whole thing, because it's about three pages long. But I'll just begin. Dearly beloved... 
on Thursday next at 7.30 and Sunday next at 10 o'clock, I purpose, through God's assistance, to administer to all as, such, as shall be religiously and devoutly disposed the most comfortable sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, to be by them received in remembrance of his meritorious cross and passion, whereby alone we obtain remission of our sins and are made partakers of the kingdom of heaven. Wherefore, it is our duty to render most humble and hearty thanks to Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that he hath given his Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, not only to die for us, but also to be our spiritual food and sustenance in that holy sacrament. There's a lot more. There's some of these books of common prayer lying around the church if you want to read the rest of them. That's just to let you know, we will be gathering on Maundy Thursday at half past seven and then on Easter Sunday together with all the church family at 10 o'clock around our Lord's table. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that uh, you know our weakness and that you haven't just provided for us a glorious saviour, but also the means by which to sustain us in knowledge of your love and in relationship with him. We thank you and praise you for your gift of yourself to us in the Holy Sacrament. In Jesus' name. Of. To help us reflect on and respond to what we've just heard, we're going to sing a hymn that we would normally sing at a communion service. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. So please stand to sing.
Please be seated, and John T is going to come and lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. I'm going to take some words from one of our hymns this morning as a framework for our prayers. Also, when I say, as we share in your passion, please respond with, raise us to new life. As we share in your passion, raise us to new life. Behold the Lamb who takes our sins away. May we find forgiveness at the cross. Thank you, Lord, for Passion Week. Thank you for communion that helps us to remember. Help us through the services and reflections to remember your ultimate sacrifice that allows us to be forgiven at your cross. Help us as reborn Christians to light the way for others to see and experience the life-changing message of Easter. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. That all may enter in to receive the life of God. We pray for the Easter Holiday Club, for strength and inspiration for the leaders, and that the children attending may feel welcomed and learn the true meaning of Easter beyond the chocolate and the bunnies. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. So we share in this bread of life. We continue to pray for insight and wisdom as the details of the Minster communities continue to be fine-tuned. We also pray for Rob and the whole ministry team here in Rotherham and bishops Martin Sadhu, as well as our previous Bishop of Loughborough Gooley, now Bishop of Chelmsford. Continue to support and guide them in their challenging roles. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. The wounds that heal. We pray for all those who are ill, in mind, body or spirit particularly those awaiting medical results or who are wait, awaiting operations. We pray for King Charles and the Princess of Wales and that her public courage may give solace for those facing difficult times, especially remembering Jill Oliver and Vanessa Baker. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. He drained death's cup that all may enter in. Lord, we pray for all those areas of conflict around our world today, in Haiti, Sudan, Yemen, especially the desperate scenes from Gaza and Ukraine, and for all those affected by the terrorist attack in Moscow. Lord of all hopefulness, may the peaceful revolution of the Easter message be an inspiration for those seeking an end to conflict. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. And so with thankfulness and faith, we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow. Send us out, Lord, in this special week to carry the hope-filled message of Easter to our families, our workplaces and our village. As we share your passion, raise us to new life. And we conclude our prayers with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today Deliver us from evil. 
Thank you, Dante. Our final hymn is another Palm Sunday classic uh, with words that help us to see beyond the procession itself. So ride on, ride on in majesty. Please stand to sing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Please accept our grateful offerings given through our banks and through the collection plate here. We pray that the gifts we've given will be used wisely to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As usual, our fellowship post, which came out on Friday, has various items of information and points for prayer. So please do read that carefully. A few things just to highlight from it. Uh, Firstly, a huge thank you to those who've been out and about delivering the Easter cards with details of this week's services to each house in the parish. Uh, We have a service each day this week at 7.30. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, these are short, reflective services as we follow the passion narrative from John's Gospel. On Monday, Thursday, as Rob said, we have the informal Holy Communion service, remembering the Last Supper. And on Good Friday evening, a service of music and readings led by the choir. Good Friday morning at 10 a.m. is our interactive all-age Jerusalem journey service, Uh, which starts in the old schoolrooms and journeys through the churchyard to the church. Um, It's it's for us to remember the events of Good Friday. Liz is still looking for some help with that service, and there's a list on the welcome table to uh, sign up, Uh, particularly if you'd like to dress up as a disciple, just very simply, kind of dressing gown and tea towel kind of uh, outfit. Um, looking for several people, please, to dress up as disciples. And also some people who are happy to prepare um, hot cross buns and uh, drinks and to um, share those at the end of that service. And then 
Tuesday is the Holiday Club, and Liz is also looking for some help still for that, particularly anyone who's free at about half past three to help tidy up, please. So do contact Liz if you can help with that. So it's a busy week ahead, but one that will prepare us to really celebrate the joy of Easter next Sunday. So our Easter morning family communion service is at 10 o'clock after the clocks go forward. So it might seem a little bit like you're coming at 9 o'clock next week, um, but it's 10 o'clock service, and then we have a service of Easter songs of praise at 6 p.m. too. And then two weeks' time is our annual church meeting. So things are a little bit different on that day as well. That's an 11 o'clock meeting, which is following the 10 o'clock service. So come at 10 for a service in two weeks' time and then stay on for the annual church meeting. This evening we have our monthly prayer meeting in church at 6 o'clock, so do come to that if you can. And please stay after the service for tea and coffee and to chat with others. And do take one of the palm crosses, so something else that helps us to remember uh, Jesus' love and death for us. So a closing prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, our true and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah. Grant us a faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and all those whom we love from this day forward forevermore. Amen. <laughs>